check. One, two, testing, one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. wonderful to work with. He's wonderful to be around. And I'm glad that you know your win, you know, barring something outlandish by your win, um, caught my attention and you said something because that's what makes me happy. And so that's something to end the year on and be happy about. And Any new shoes? No, 983. So he's, you know, I actually thought going into the last weekend when we made a couple errors, I thought Stony Brook was going to take it and then I heard three in a game. Okay, maybe we'll get it. we'll have here? 20? Well, new role here for me. I get to stand up and sit up here and point.
On behalf of the NCAA, Creighton University, the City of Omaha, and Mecca, welcome to the 68th College World Series. Our first game will begin at 2 p.m. on Saturday when UC Irvine and Texas open the College World Series. The second game will be at 7 p.m. as Louisville battles Vanderbilt. Sunday's matchup will feature the coaches that are with us right now, Texas Tech versus TCU at 2 p.m., followed by Old Miss playing Vanderbilt at 7 p.m. Before we begin, my name is Glenn Sisk. I'll be your moderator from Creighton University. I'd like to ask all cell phones to be silenced and then you refrain from videotaping any of the press conferences during the CWS with your personal devices, tablets, or cell phones. If you need video, we can help you get plugged into the molt boxes in the back. There's various people there that can help you out with that process. During the interview, please raise your hand once you're called upon, state your name as well as your affiliation and then we'll have you ask your question to any of the coaches. And finally, throughout the entire CWS, if you have individual interview requests, I ask that you coordinate that with the eight respective sports formation directors for our participating institutions. This morning, we are joined by the four teams that will play on Sunday from left to right with over 500 victories in his career and having the distinction of leading the 2013 USA Collegiate National Team making his second appearance at the College World Series, TCU head coach Jim Schlossnagel. Continuing to the left, or excuse me, continuing to the left, in just his second season at the helm of the Red Raiders, he led Texas Tech to a 45-19 and record this season to win their 2014 National College Baseball Hall of Fame Skim Bur Skip Burtman National Coach of the Year honor, Texas Tech head coach Tim Tadlock boasting the third highest winning percentage of all coaches at 74% of all active coaches. Our third coach is a two-time National Coach of the Year and four-time ACC recipient, Virginia head coach Brian O'Connor. And finally, on the far left, in his 14th season as the leader of Ole Miss, Coach Bianco has amassed over 500 victories for the Rebels. After reaching the College World Series as a player in 1989, he guided Ole Miss to their first appearance here at the College World Series since 1972, head coach Mike Bianco. We'll ask for opening statements, and Coach Schlossnagel, if you would open, that, open the floor for us. Great. Uh, really excited to be uh, here in Omaha in the College World Series. Obviously, this is a dream of every, every player and coach, uh, the pearly gates of college baseball, as I like to call it. Um, we were, we were la here last in uh, 2010, in the last year of Rosenblatt Stadium, so really looking, in, uh, really looking forward to, uh, to what the experience with the new stadium and everything around the downtown area is going to be like. Uh, it's an honor to be up here with these three other coaches, three guys that I've known for a long time and uh, you know, run the roads with as assistant coaches. And Coach Bianco and I spent all last summer together with the USA national team. So it's just a great honor. Our players, fans, uh, everybody in Fort Worth, Texas is excited and Looking forward to uh, beginning play. Coach Tadlock. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate all the uh, universities that are here, uh, TCU and Virginia and Ole Miss and uh, all the other clubs that are in the other side of the bracket and uh, everybody's administration. And uh, it's a neat deal to be here and we're excited about the challenge of the competition. And uh, of course, I want to thank all the people back home in Lubbock. Uh, it's been a it's been a neat time back there here the last couple weeks, and uh, we're looking forward to uh, competing this week. Coach O'Connor. I'll tell you that uh, we're certainly very honored to be here, um, be back in Omaha. Uh, I know these gentlemen that are sitting at the table with me can contest that uh, it's, it's really difficult to get here. You know, and the, the other four coaches that are here and the teams that are here, it's a, uh, it's a tremendous challenge to get to Omaha. You know, uh, there's a lot of teams that their seasons are over, and we all understand how, how difficult of a journey it is throughout the season, but then when you get into postseason play uh, to do what it takes to, to get here. Not only do you have to have a, 
a good baseball team, you have to also have to have a little bit of good fortune. Um, we're certainly uh, very honored to, to be back here. Um, we'd like to, uh, our university would like to thank everybody in the city of Omaha for, for their hospitality. Uh, this is, as I say, the, the greatest college sporting event out there, you know, um, because it takes place over a two-week period, and <clears throat> the people in the city of Omaha uh, wrap their arms around this event, and, and uh, we couldn't be happier to be here, and we look forward to uh, getting out there and playing some good baseball. Coach Bianco. Um, like the other coaches said, it, uh, you know, excited and honored uh, to be here. Uh, congratulations to all the coaches, the three here, and of course the, the four in the other bracket. As Brian just said, uh, you know, we were joking outside before we walked in here, and I've said, you know, our beat writers have heard me say this, you know, several times that, uh, you know, the road to Omaha isn't a, isn't a straight one. You know, it's it's very windy and bumpy, and and uh, nobody knows that more than than we do. And uh, this, uh, you know, our fifth Super Regional and finally, you know, punched our ticket here. We're, we're excited to be here. Uh, we, I joked about them that uh, my days at LSU as an assistant in the 90s, you know, how easy Skip Burtman made it look, you know, to, to get here uh, and, and all those great LSU teams. And, uh, you know, when I got to Ole Miss, uh, you know, thought I had the blueprint. You know, once you got to Omaha, this is what you do. But unfortunately, it took 14 years and uh, heck, they don't even play in the same stadium anymore. So, uh, you know, that, that the blueprint isn't as, as good as it once was. But uh, again, we're honored and excited to be here and, and can't, get, uh, can't uh, wait for it to get started. All right, we'll open the floor to questions. Coach Slosnagel, Mike talked about not having been there in a long time, and he said that he called you and Dan McDonald to ask about Omaha as many times as he had been to ask about Omaha and just structure and routine. What, what did you tell him? Uh, you know, uh, not that I have tremendous amount of experience here. One time as an assistant coach in 2001 and, and then in 2010. My, my only advice to anybody, I'll just give uh, the same advice I gave to our team, is I feel like uh, – as Brian said, it's so very hard to get here. I think some people try to uh, try to uh, make the guys just completely lock in on baseball, which it, we're, that's why we're here. But at the same time, I think we're foolish to not think that they're not going to want to enjoy the other days. So I've challenged my team to uh, to have a split personality, and that's you know on days that are like today where there's an opportunity other than your practice time to be a fan, you really need to enjoy being a fan. And when there's days for baseball, you need to be locked into baseball. And I think it's possible to do that. And uh, I, I think for us to think that that's not going to happen is foolish. And we're cutting those guys short because it's so hard to get here. And uh, so that that would be my that would be my advice. But he he's been here way way more times than I have. So I probably need to ask him. As a reminder, please introduce yourself and your affiliation before asking your question. Yeah, back. Matt Roberts, KOBK TV, uh, Coach Tadlock. I know you guys like to focus on one game at a time and are focused on TCU on Sunday. But can you talk about what an honor it is to win the Skip Bertman Coach of the Coach of the Year this morning? Well, we we uh, first of all, I think our league deserves a little bit of recognition for that. I mean, I probably should have said that in the opening deal. I mean, we we got a really good league and uh, some really good coaches in our league, good assistant coaches in our league, and then. And uh, our league kind of put us in position to do that by being able to get into postseason and be able to kind of get on a run. Uh, got really good people around us. I mean, Coach Hayward and uh, Coach Gardner and Coach Thomas, uh, our operations guy, Coach Hughes, I mean, and then our whole administration and and really just top to bottom. I mean, it's uh, – we got a really good group of people and um, pretty big small part – I mean, I'm a small part of the deal and uh, – just really just thankful to be here. Mike Bonner from the Clarion Ledger. Uh, Mike, you talked about kind of the, the road to get here. What was it like when you finally got here for you personally? You know, a, a lot's been asked of that and, and certainly, you know, a ton of emotions, you know, on Monday night and, you know, fortunate to have most of my family uh, uh, there and, you know, just a great moment, uh, but you know the thing I think that touched me the most is you know to watch the kids run out you know on the field and dog pile and 
uh, you know, that, you know it, was, it was a neat thing. And then another cool thing that I didn't really put together until later, you know, the, the first two guys that I touched, you know, Stephen Head and Jordan Henry, which, you know, both assistant coaches ran up and hugged me. And both of those guys had, you know, uh, been in the dugout, but on the bad end of that game three of a super regional head in 05 when we lost to Texas, you know, at home. And, uh, you know, Jordan Henry when we lost to Brian's team in 09. And so, uh, you know, it was kind of a neat moment that, uh, you know, because when you get there, you, I think all coaches, you know, w would attest that, uh, you know, it's really for everyone. You know, a lot of guys that, uh, you know, were great players and great teams that in truth of the matter, in my opinion, a lot of them deserved to go. But unfortunately, they didn't because uh, the other team played better than them. And, as, you know, as Brian said, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a tough road. So uh, a lot of emotions, but, uh, you know, a lot's been said about me and getting there, but I'm just super proud of this team. Howard, Howard, Howard Borden, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, KCRO uh, Radio. First of all, congratulations to all the coaches. Best of luck here in Omaha. This is for all the coaches. Could you talk a little bit about the personnel of your team defensively? Uh, this ballpark sometimes plays big, and there's been a lot of talk about teams uh, going through their uh, conference tournaments, regionals, and supers, and getting here by playing good defense, and I think that could be a big uh, your defense. What's your defense all about for all four coaches? Coach O'Connor, can you lead us off? Sure. Um, <clears throat> I think our, 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 our defense is one of the real uh, strong points of our, our ball club. Uh, we had won 50 ball games last year, and as – I'm sure these guys do too. After the season's over, you sit back and you you assess your club moving into next year and where can we get better at. And uh, our, our our defense was an area that I thought that we needed to improve from last year, and uh, and we did. We've um, I, I think have a really skilled uh, infield defense, and we have three outfielders that can uh, run and go get it and cover some territory. So. Uh, it's an area that's really important to us, and I think we've done a pretty good job with it all year. Coach Schlossnagel? Yeah, you know, I think anybody who has seen our team play uh, realizes that uh, we are uh, have to be an opportunistic offense. Therefore, that puts as much pressure on our pitching and defense as anybody, anybody possibly can. Um, our ballpark, uh, as Coach Tadlock uh, and Coach Bianco can uh, attest, plays very similar to this place. Um, it's big. The wind blows in most days out of the south. And so uh, pitching and defense are at a premium. Um, you know, I think we – our catcher, our center fielder are pretty elite defensive players. Uh, in the infield, we have to catch the balls that we get our hands on. I mean, I don't, I don't think we have tremendous range, but we play – you know, we, we just have to play sound baseball, and obviously part of that is throwing strikes and playing great defense. Coach Bianco? Um, as you said in your question, I don't think you get to this point unless you can catch it in college baseball now. You know, much has been said about the bats and the lack of offense. And, and so, uh, you know, I don't think you get to this point unless you, you, know, you pitch and play defense. And uh, uh, it's not the best defensive club we've ever had, uh, but we're solid. And uh, we're solid in the infield. Will Allen's had a tremendous, uh, you know, year behind the plate for us. But it might be the best defensive outfield, which is more, I think, will play more, you know, uh, make the difference in this part. Uh, the, the fastest outfield we've ever had um, and, and guys that have just made plays. Uh, I laughed early in the season, Braxton Lee in left field has more, made more diving catches in one year than we may have had in our program in, in, since I've been here. I mean, just uh, him and uh, Boz out in center field and, and either Woodman or Jamison in, in, in right field, not a guy runs you know, slower than a 6'6 six, six in the outfield and they just cover a lot of ground, which hopefully that'll make a, a little bit of difference you know, uh, in, in a mayor trade. Coach Tadlock? Uh, we've been pretty decent. I mean, uh, for the most part, pitching and catching it. And uh, we've had a bunch of guys in and out of the lineup. Uh, we had a shortstop that was out for about 20 games. Uh, had an outfielder who was out about the same amount. And uh, But for the most part, we've been able to put a club out there that can pitch it and catch it if we need to. And also, uh, we've taken some risks some days and gone with a little more uh, we call it the big package uh, on at certain times, which I don't know if you can get away with here at Rosenblatt uh, with the spacious outfield. Uh, but in our ballpark at home and, and even at Coach Slosh and Eagles, uh, there's certain days with the wind blowing, ball hangs up a little more. And uh, really playing defense, I mean, you're going to uh, – 
you got to give something to get something. And uh, we try to put guys in the right spot best we can. And I mean, all, all that can go out the window real easy if you're not locating the pitch. And so it all really comes back to that bump out there in the middle of the field. John Davis, Northeast Mississippi Daily Journal. Coach O'Connor, this question is for you about your pitching staff. You know, you talked about defense. Uh, this is a great regional, or this side of the regional from a pitching standpoint, but just talk about your success with your, your staff this year. Well, I'll tell you, uh, coming into the season, there was certainly um, some uncertainty about our staff. I, I felt like we had uh, a lot of talent. There was a lot of skill um, on the staff, but there wasn't a lot of experience uh, because we, what we had lost from the year before. Um, but I'll tell you, it, it took shape really, really quickly. Uh, Nathan Kirby has been our number one all year long, and he's been uh, tremendous. And and uh, you know, our uh, Brandon Waddell has been in our rotation all year, and he's done a nice job too. And um, Josh Spores and Artie Lewicki have both spent time in our in our rotation. So. Um, you know, I, I think our pitching staff is talented. I think it's. I think the depth is really good. Um, I think we're pretty good at the end of the game uh, with Nick Howard and some other guys. We can bring in before him. So, it's been um, it's been very very consistent for us from from start to finish. Um, so, Dirk, this is for uh, this is for two Dirk, or three. Introduce years. yourself. Sorry, Dirk Chatwin, Omaha World Herald. Uh, obviously, the, the hot topic in baseball this spring, especially at the pro level, has been the arm injuries. And uh, I'd be curious in getting, you know, two or, two or three of you to chime in on what you think is the primary cause for, for the recent rash of pitching injuries and, uh, and also maybe what to do about it. Coach Schlossschlengel. You know, it's such a broad topic. Um, I think it's going to be different for, for each injury. I mean, you know, you could probably come up with a reason or an excuse uh, as it goes across the board. Everybody wants to point to strength and conditioning or they want to point to, you know, too much baseball or too much pitching. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I think it's tough to answer. Um, if I had to pick one thing, I would say that I heard somebody say at the MLB channel did a, a, a neat special on it that there's a, there's a whole lot of pitching and there's not a whole lot of throwing. And, uh, you know, I mean, my son's in this room, and, and I know, uh, you know, he, uh, he plays a fair amount of baseball, but there's not a lot of, you know, there's a lot of organized play. There's not a lot of disorganized play. And I think the more, if we had more disorganized play where guys were just playing catch, maybe the arms would be in better shape. Um, I do believe that college baseball coaches across the board take care of pitchers much better than, uh, than we get credit for. And uh, I think as you have in any profession, there's always going to be a handful of guys that they manage their club in a different way, and that's their right. Uh, and sometimes that, gets a, that gives a bad rap to the people who, uh, who don't do that. But I think there's a lot of people out there that write things that are very, very uninformed, specifically about college baseball. Coach Bianco? Um, John, you're laughing. Yeah, I was hoping they'd pick one of the smart guys. Um, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure, like uh, like Jim said, there, there's there's certainly a lot of reasons for it, and I don't know if there's one. But the one that I think is the biggest difference now than anything, it's not about a college coach pitching a guy on short rest. I think, as Jim said, you know, we, we are more conscious of it, and you guys are more conscious of it and have a lot more information as, you know, reporters. I think uh, – I, I don't think that's the case. I think the biggest difference in my mind is when you look at youth league baseball. When I played youth league baseball, you could pitch six innings a week, and you pitched once a week, and that was it, and you played for about ten weeks. You played an all-star uh, tournament, and it was over. And you're, then you went and played football. Then you went and played basketball or soccer or something else, and then you played baseball again. These kids, starting at you know eight, nine years old, play year-round in the tournaments because of the money that people make off the tournaments, allow all these teams, you know, 50, 60, 70 teams, and now you're allowed to pitch 12 innings in a week or nine innings in a week, and you can pitch three innings. If you pitch three or less, you can get a you, you don't need a days off. If I pitch Lance Lynn three day three innings every single day for four inning or uh, for four days, that would be insane. But they do that to these young kids all the time, and they do it all year long. And I don't know if that's it, 
But that's the only, you know, the biggest difference I think now. It's not the strength training. It's not college coaches pitching them more uh, or high school coaches. I think these kids from the age of 10 years old pitch so many more innings uh, than, than I or anybody ever did, uh, you know, growing up. Let's go to the next question. Grew up uh, by Roland Blast. So I'm thinking about the uh, question that uh, of you, Mike, and the blueprint. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Vinny will be at the 61 of 64 College World Series is here. So, wow, what a difference. So, players and process and uh, parity, the parity issues. You know, back in uh, uh, 1950, 51, the 60s, it was like, USC will be here in either Arizona or Arizona State, and who else? And then the process changed. So, so the issue of parity, so you guys want to address that. How are players different in the last, say, 10 years to, to today, if at all? Is that to me? That, to any one of you, actually. And, uh, um, and, and then just the process of the 64-team regional. How do you retain your energy by the time you get here? Okay. Let's have Coach Tadlock start us off. Part of that question, you said, "How do you retain your energy?" Is that what you said? When you get here, is that what you, the end of the question was? I we, we don't have any problem with energy. I mean, we try to try to manage that the best we can, and I'm sure anybody, any team that's gotten here to this point is pretty good at that, as far as that goes. As far as parity in college baseball, uh, you know, there, it's interesting. You look across the country, and uh, it's. Uh, it's just really interesting to me that, you know, if you get in, you really got a really good chance of getting in. But the easiest way to explain it for me is there's a lot of good baseball guys out there working really hard. There's a lot of guys that aren't here. Uh, there's a lot of good baseball people that aren't in college baseball uh, that are in all kinds of professions. And uh, But when you line up in – Right now in Division One baseball, junior college baseball, there's just guys working their tail off across the country. Now, the interesting part about the parity discussion to me is, is when you start really looking at the different states and what's really out there amongst the different states, and that's a whole different topic. Uh, most of us, I want to say, I mean, I mean, you're talking about a private school here, so it's about as hard as it gets as far as that at a private school, and then you talk. A big school, you know, all state universities as far as that goes. But each state has its different uh, limits and boundaries on what they can do with scholarships. And so the parity deal is uh, we could talk about it a long time. I mean, I think all of us could go sit down and have dinner and go, well, we'd like to have those in state deals that don't count against 11 7. But we all don't have them. And, uh, but that's the card you're dealt. And uh, the simplest thing is, though, what your question is, the simplest thing is there's a lot of people out there working really hard. And uh, that's why you have the equal balance across college baseball. I mean, you don't get to this point. Uh, you don't get to postseason without working hard and without doing things the right way. So, uh, and we don't have enough time to talk about the parity deal. Let's go to the next question. Seven, 17 from former Sub Dog Man. Is my on? Should be. The state of Texas has three uh, teams uh, here. What does that say about the state of uh, baseball in Texas? And um, Big 12 had sort of a down year last year, and four teams were two games away from uh, being here. Do you think the Big 12 is as good as any conference in the, in the country? He's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think on any given day, I think our league, I think we've said that across the board. I think we can play with anybody. At the same time, I think I think that's probably the case in a lot of leagues. Uh, I think our league on any given day, though, can play baseball with anybody. Uh, I think we had a really good year this year in our league. Uh, I think Tim Wisner, I think Bob Berta do a great job with our league. I think baseball is important to the Big 12. Uh, I think uh, – it's a neat recognition for us to have three teams here and almost had four here and could real easy. I mean, there's could have been another team get hot and maybe got here. Uh, but really to get three here is quite an accomplishment. Uh, it's something that's uh, neat for the state of Texas. 
there's some really good teams in the state of Texas that aren't here. Uh, and he and I know that, and these guys know that. I mean, there's guys out there on the road right now trying to beat us next year. I mean, I can assure you right now, they're trying to round up some guys and, and uh, put together a competitive team. And uh, we all really enjoy that competition. We all get along. Uh, it's a neat fraternity of people and uh, just a neat time. I think, you know, regarding our, our, our league, uh, you know, this is only our second year in the conference in the Big 12, but what's unique about this scenario this year is the three teams there in Omaha finished seventh, eighth, and ninth in the conference last year. And so, uh, you know, it was a great turnaround for our conference. Um, you know, again, I've, I, we've been touting the, the, uh, the, the, the qualities of our league all season. And, and for me, and again, no disrespect, I mean, I grew up in Western Maryland in the heart of ACC country, and I cut my teeth as an assistant coach in New, in New Orleans in the heart of SEC country, so I know how great those leagues are. I'm just glad that everything that we've been talking about all year showed itself on the field of play. And with regards to the state of Texas, um, there are so many good players. I know uh, – I know uh, Brian has a, one, has a guy on his team from Texas, right, at least one, and, and Mike, you as well. I'm not sure, but I know he's, he's come in and pillaged our state before. But uh, it's, uh, it's just there's so many good players and so many good teams, whether it be the, you know, the big schools like Tech and Texas and A&M or you know, Dallas Baptist uh, is phenomenally talented, probably have a top 15 team next year. So there's just so many good players, and, and it just eventually showed itself on the field. Alford Tupelo, Mississippi, for Coach O'Connor and for Coach Bianco. You guys have a little bit of somewhat recent postseason history. Does that play at all into the preparation for your game, or has too much time passed? I I personally don't think it plays into anything. Um, those were different teams, uh, different players. Um, so nothing that we've done in the past with regards to Ole Miss, I think, factors in at all into uh, Sunday night. Um, we know the kind of program o Ole Miss has. We know how talented their players are. Um, our team's different than those past teams, and I'm sure for Coach it's, it's the same. Yeah, we, uh, I, don't, I don't think we have anybody on the roster, do we? It'd have to be somebody that redshirted or, or something. It was 9 and 10, so, you know, it was so long ago that uh, uh, I don't think it matters. You know, to the fans and to you guys – Maybe. Uh, is there anybody? I don't know. Allen and all those guys weren't on that team. So it'd have to be a red shirt guy. So answer is no. <laughs> yeah, Andrew Rance, Packer, Charlottesville, Daily Progress. Coach Bianco, going back to that series, though, in 09, could you get a sense? That was Virginia's first Super Regional and obviously going to the first College World Series. Could you get a sense that was a program on the rise now they're here? As this is their third trip now since that time. Again, you know, a long time ago, but they, you know, they were terrific. Uh, you know, I, I I remember back where you know we were matched up with. Um, we, we probably you know got home because you know Strasburg you know, didn't win, and so you know I don't know which one which would have been better, uh, but uh, Virginia came in and, and pl played great. You know, we won a, a fir the, the first game in extra innings. We hit a you know one of those dramatic walk off home runs and. Uh, but you know, then the next two games were very co uh, very close, and, and they played very well, and you know deserved to win. You know, it was one of those things where you could see what a great job, and and, and I don't know their history as much, but you know, you heard you know all the wins and all the success that Brian had had up there, and, and they were kind of like us. You know, one of the, you know this year one of those teams is you know gonna you know break through and get to Omaha, and you know uh, unfortunately for us it was them. Uh, but, you know, they were terrific and, and really uh, terrific since then. And, you know, of course, we played them in, in 2010 and kind of watched them, you know, through the years. And, you know, I, I think probably back to your question, once you play them, you recognize them more. You know, I think, you know, when you see them in a regional or a super regional, watch them go to Omaha, I think for the fans and even as the coaches and players, you, you remember back to that series. Not that it's significant now, but you, you're probably more aware of, you know, their success. And, and certainly they've, they've been tremendous, and, and Brian's done a, a great job there. Mike Bonner from the Clarion Ledger. Brian, last year in the super regionals against Mississippi State, you, Sometimes it seemed like the players were making some uncharacteristic errors in, in the field. How did that experience for a young team maybe help them grow as a team this year in the Super Regionals maybe going forward? 
Well, I, I think it helped a lot. I mean, part of that was was Mississippi State. I mean, they they came to Charlottesville for the Super Regional last year, and they just played lights out and, and uh, put a lot of pressure on us, and we, quite frankly, didn't handle it real well. So, um, you know, I think any time you can have the experience that they did have last year, um, you get a chance to, to be better the next time out. And so uh, a lot, of, almost all those players were on that club last year. And so, you know, we got to that point again this year in the Super Regional and, you know, they figured it out and played really good, cons consistent baseball. Far back on the right. Pete LaFleur, College Baseball 360 for Coach O'Connor. Short guy here in the back. Hey, uh, Coach, um, as you know, I was at Virginia back in the mid-90s and had kind of a magical season and made the NCAAs, but I remember the field, the old uh, football field, and you could see the the AstroTurf uh, and, the, and then watching your, your team this week in the great stadium. If you could, since this is your third trip to Omaha, highlight three key elements that have helped you build the program at Virginia for, for those of us. Uh, it, the th maybe three, 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 three. Th Three key things. Wow, Pete. Um, I think I'll say what Tim said, pitching, pitching, pitching. <laughs> we done? <Yeah>. No. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would say certainly it, it, first it starts with um, putting a, a good coaching staff together. You know, um, <clears throat> I think for any of us up here, um, it's so important of who you surround yourself with. And I've been very, very fortunate to have uh, two outstanding assistant coaches that have been with us for 11 years. Um, so I, I think it starts with that, Pete, on uh, putting a good staff together that's hardworking and, and knows, knows what they're doing. Um, then I'd say recruiting the right young men to, to compete for you and represent your program. And uh, that's an area that we feel like we've had quite a bit of success in. And, and then, um, the third thing I'd say is uh, is player development. You know, you you have those coaches, you recruit the right young men, and then you have to develop them. And I'm really proud of what we've done there from a uh, player development standpoint. And the players coming there and getting better and moving on to professional baseball, but during their time at Virginia, uh, helping us win a lot of ball games. Matt Roberts, KOBK. This is for Coach Tadlock and Coach Schlossnagel. Uh, Given the quality arms on both of these staffs, uh, can you guys talk about just the challenge of going up against them you know, for a fifth time this year, particularly those frontline guys in Sadbury and Finnegan? Well, I haven't announced the starting pitcher yet. Uh, well, I mean, they have a – I've said all year long that Tech's pitching staff was uh, – I don't know if underrated is the right word, but we were, we've been very, very aware of how talented they are, uh, not just Sadbury, who's probably been – the most consistent starting pitcher. I think he's the guy who started the most games probably on the weekends for him. I have phenomenal respect for him as well, but mainly their bullpen. Um, Johnny Draws uh, and Cam Smith, those guys seem like all-time pitchers. You know, they, they come in the game in the second inning or, and, or they can start a game as Smith did in the regional or they can close a game. So, uh, you know, Tim's team is very, very deep. His pitching staff is – it's a pitching staff that I that I really like because they do, they can do a lot of different things relative to who they're playing um, or whatever the matchup is at home plate. So uh, honestly, with that pitching staff, uh, he probably shouldn't lose a game here. <laughs> Coach Tadlock, can we compare numbers now. <laughs> they say numbers don't lie, right? His uh, his staff obviously with Finnegan and. Uh, and Alexander and Morrison and Kipper and Farrell and just keep going down the list. I mean, you got one arm good, you know, just uh, good arm after good arm. And uh, really just, you know, it's really impressive what kind of staff they put together. And obviously we know whoever they name, we got our hands full as far as that goes. And uh, all those guys again, kind of like what he said about our guys. I mean, he he's uh, he's got a power guy in the, in the left hander and Finnegan, and then Morrison's kind of. How do you explain Morrison? I don't really know how you explain him other than he can really pitch and uh, he has a lot of deception. And then Alexander's done a great job in his first year, 
uh, in the Big 12 for a young man to go out and uh, start on Sundays and win as many games he did. I think he threw two complete games there late for him and probably clinched the regional and I think also the Big 12 tournament. And uh, really proud of that young man. I mean, you get to know these guys and just proud of him at that point and, and all of them, really. I mean, we kind of, other than Morrison, I guess, we kind of run into all of them. Uh, Finnegan and uh, I don't think we ran into Farrell. You got there before us. But uh, all those guys, I mean, you're just proud of them, and he's done a really good job for them. And, uh, but we're looking forward to the challenge. At this point in the year, whoever you face, they're going to have some pitching. And, but I do think you ought to go back and look at the numbers because the deal about not losing a game, I don't know about all that <laughs> carrying on. Aslan Hodges from ABC in Jackson. A question for Coach Bianco. You joked about having that blueprint from Skip Burtman in the, the, the 14 years over there. Is the, it's been such a long time. Is there anything timeless from that mentality or approach uh, from that blueprint that you did learn from Skip in your time being out in Omaha with him? I think, and in, in going back to you know originally what, what, what Jim said and, and talking to Dan and, and actually talking to Coach Burtman, you know, after the Super Regional, I think the thing comes back to for everybody is, yeah, to try to find that that mix of, uh, you know, you want them to enjoy it, you know, you want them to, to take it in, you want them to be loose, but you also got to be able to lock in, and uh, and and that's important. I mean, you know, you're you're playing the best teams in the country, and uh, you got to be at your best, and you got to play your best, and you know, in our game, you know, uh, you know, it's not about necessarily the most talented team; it's the team that plays the best. And can you do that here? And I think another thing that, that is not talked about much it's it's so much different than any baseball tournament that you've ever played in. That you play and win or lose, you get a day off, or you come in on Thursday and you don't play till Sunday night. I mean, it's it's not your normal setting for them. They're used to either a three game series or a conference tournament region where you play every single day sometimes you play double headers uh there's a lot of free time and so you know i think it's it's a challenge you know to, to keep them you know locked in you know at certain points and so uh, uh but i think that's the challenge for everyone mark giannato from the washington post this is for all four of you since you brought up starting pitchers i'll give you a the venue here if you want to each announce who you're pitching on Saturday and Sunday. We'll ask our Coach O'Connor to start. We'll, we will start Nathan Kirby. <clears throat> we'll go with Coach Schlossnagel. Preston Morrison will pitch. Coach Tadlock. Chris Sadbury. Coach Bianco. Chris Ellis. I'm really surprised one of you didn't say TBA. <laughs> Again, Jim Meyer, uh, sports psychology coach, and uh, it kind of is that question about, um, is this on? It is. This is on? Okay, good. Uh, the format being that you come in Thursday, some of you don't play till Sunday night, what you don't play Sunday night. Uh, it's a question of comfort zone. How, how do you get the guys comfortable in, it really is in some ways an uncomfortable world. Not that it's bad, it's just different, it's new. And I just wonder how you – you, because part – I believe that getting comfortable quickly is going to be so critically important to playing physically, technically well. So, Coach Schlossnagel. Well, you know, I think we all – I don't know. I think um, Tim did the same thing. You know, as soon as we got off the plane, came straight to the stadium, uh, try and knock off some of the edge of uh, that anxiety or – or just a desire to see your surroundings, that kind of thing. Um, get in, get in uh, as, as much of a normal routine as you possibly can, whether it be, you know, the time you have team breakfast, the time that you meet on your scouting report, if you do that. Just, just get in that general routine uh, to get them as close to it as you possibly can. It's, it's not going to be the same as, as the uh, regular season or even the last two weeks, like Mike said. Uh, but just... Um, you know, I think, you know, we, we talk the mental game all year. And, uh, you know, and, and they're told beginning of the season that, you know, a ground ball hit at, at Lufton Stadium in Fort Worth is the same ground ball that's hit at TD Ameritrade Park. It's just a ground ball. And everything that you – anything that's different is what's outside. So whether it be your pregame routine, whether your pre-pitch routine or how you're going to flush something that's negative, if, 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 you, if you practice those things all year long and you trust them, and you talk about them, 
um, then when you get to this situation, uh, that's, that's what you're going to rely on. Are we got time about three more questions? We're we'll start, start up here. Being here at the openspiritscout.com. Mike, you uh, said earlier this week that it was you were kind of undecided about Chris or Christian for Sunday. Why, why Chris? What, was it a difficult decision for you? No, you know, we, I just wanted to make sure because at the time that all you guys wanted to know, we hadn't looked at anything from Virginia. Uh, and, and so at, at the end of the day, he's been our ace. He's been our ace all year long. And I just thought it didn't make sense to, to, to rearrange the rotation. Uh, for, for that to just keep them in their normal, you know, uh, rest. Uh, the other thing was that, you know, Chris warmed up on Monday and so wanted to make sure that he was okay. You know, he had a, you know, a short, you know, short outing on, on Saturday and uh, before we, you know, uh, scored, you know, the, had that big ninth inning, you know, he warmed up, you know, just in case that we needed him to finish the game. And so wanted to make sure, you know, that he was okay and he hadn't you know, thrown since then. So it was really just to not, you know, throw a name out there just because, and next thing you know, have to pull it off. And so, you know, we just want to make sure. But, uh, you know, I think from that point forward, we knew we'd go with Chris. Two more. Matt Roberts, KOBK. Coach Schlossnagel, can you just talk about the decision to go with Preston over a guy like uh, Finnegan and, and your thought process there? Uh, you know, to me, just just – Brandon's, you know, they, they, they've both pitched uh, the opening game of series. Uh, you know, uh, Morrison pitched on Friday night almost all of last year. Um, you know, he's, he's the Big 12 pitcher of the year. Um, you know, he, he kind of does unique things, as Tim mentioned, and, and Brandon is a completely different pitcher. So, for us, it's more about, you know, where we think guys match up with the teams that uh, are, are in our bracket and um, how guys are pitching lately. Uh, again, like he, you know, there's really at this level, they're really intercha interchangeable, and uh, just feel like right now that's the way we're, you know we're going to go with Preston. One last question. Uh, Lee Barfnick from the Omaha World Herald. This is for Tim. With uh, this being Tech's first time to come to Omaha, you got any stories uh, you've heard from fans or people organizing their way to get up here to see you and? Uh, looking for tickets, things like that? Well, definitely tickets has been uh, a little bit of an issue. A uh, bunch of stories. I don't know if we've had a bunch of time for to, for me to hear of all the stories. I know there's uh, – I know a bunch of the coaches are coming, a bunch of the administration are coming, how they're getting here. I was actually wondering that about a couple hours ago and was wondering if I needed to share parking passes. We were talking about that pulling in here. Uh, tickets are, uh, I mean, we just like these guys. I mean, you can't come up with enough tickets for people. All right, like we'd like to thank the coaches for coming. If you have individual questions, please contact the sports information director for the four institutions that are here. Our next press conference will be the state of baseball. Check one, two, check one, two.
I, I noticed that you were doing it. I apologize. That's all right. So if you could just kind of like denote, because I got to know, I can't keep all of my stuff open. So I just, if you can just kind of denote who's going to talk next, right, right before they're doing it. Because I know you're aware of it. And I realized you were, like, you were six ahead. And I was like, where is he? I'm going to bounce back and forth as much as I can. So we'll alternate back and forth. If I don't have that option, then I'll stay. But I'll try and I'll try and say right, left, back, front. And that's perfect.
Dennis. So these two are I feel like you're following me, Judy. It is, but I will get rid of it. Taking the moment to stretch his legs and be comfortable. I've been called Guy, Gene, I've been called Gary, I've been called a lot of things. And those are just the ones that I'm willing to, to admit to. How many folks do we have in our field? Four. It'll be four, four again. Okay. Uh, Thanks, Craig and Dave Kylett, Damani Leach, and then this will be Dennis Farrell. Did that work for you to me to have yeah, one? Totally fine, totally fine. Yeah, it was great. The four together, and I'm off here to the side to yeah, stay off yeah. camera as much as possible. Is okay with me. <laughs> Not really so much of a group. <laughs> that is perfectly Unlike. okay. Unlike. All right. Mr. Chattel, right. you want to do me a favor? You want to go there? Why? So that uh, the gentleman that was there is not there? <laughs> Come on, Tom. <laughs> yes, but it's not right directly in front of my face. <laughs> All right. You're not helping me out, Tom. Check one, two. 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 Check
Check. One, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one, two. Check one. Check one, two. Check. Yes, sir. didn't happen. Shirt and tie happens. You got the uh, great logo done. High five right there. Had to get the university in somehow. <laughs> the whole ballpark is in now? No. No, it's not. <laughs> what do you guys average this year? Anyway? We averaged uh, a little over 14. Helped out by well, games well, where... What's that? <laughs> no, we didn't. Um, we might have had the second Nebraska game been played, but the military game, you're right. The military game we had, but it was 12,000. Okay. It wasn't 14. <laughs> military day every year always is going to draw a ton, and kids' day drew a ton as well, but you're talking about goes or giveaway tickets. First one went relatively well, and yeah. so but we've got you guys set up, and we we'll do the brief intro, and and then hand it over to you and say opening statements. And we'll walk, uh, Damani. We're going to ask you to do the first opening statements, okay? And then we'll go Dennis, and then we'll walk down to the to the uh, Kylix. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. And on the opening statements, we'll have Damani lead. We'll come back to Dennis, and then we'll go to yourself, and then finish with Craig for opening statements. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Craig, I see you again. Craig Kylix, 
Thanks to meet you. Really? Just sign up while I'll let you up here. How you doing, man? Good. Right there. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the annual State of the Collegiate Baseball Press Conference. We are joined to my left, first by Division I Baseball Committee Chair Dennis Farrell, the Commissioner of the Big West Conference. Moving left from there, Damani Leach, the NCAA Managing Director for Championships and Alliances. Dave Kylitz, who after 19 years as the, as the American Baseball Coaches Association Executive Director will be retiring this month. And the individual trying to fill those big shoes of Dave will be his son, Craig Kylitz, incoming American Baseball Coaches Association Executive Director. We will ask each of you for an opening statement, and we'd like to remind you following this interview session, we encourage everyone in attendance to remain for the 2 o'clock interview session with Saturday's baseball coaches. We'll ask for an opening statement first from Damani. Thanks. Um, I guess on behalf of the NCAA, um, we certainly want to welcome the eight teams that we have here in Omaha. It's been a great tournament so far, uh, a lot of exciting play for all of our fans to, to watch and capture as the teams have advanced here to Omaha. We're, we're excited, continue to be excited about our relationship with the Omaha community here, um, working on 60 plus years of that, that great relationship um, that continues to improve year after year. Our, our two primary goals remain the same, and, and that's to crown the best team in college baseball and to provide great experiences for the student athletes and fans along the way. So we're committed to doing that and look forward to doing that again this year. Dennis, we'll ask you to give an opening statement. Well, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, congratulate uh, Dave Kylitz for a remarkable career as the executive director of the American Baseball Coaches Association. I know that Craig's got huge shoes to fill. Uh, someday when I decide to ride off into the sunset, I have a son that's working in this industry now, and, and I know for a fact that he won't be able to fill my shoes. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, for one thing, his feet are bigger than mine, but, uh, uh, but seriously, Dave, you know, we were just talking that the, 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 the state of baseball, which is what we're supposed to talk about today, but uh, I think that the state of baseball has improved so much under Dave's leadership, and as a commissioner of a conference, I've had the opportunity to deal with many uh, uh, executive directors of, of coaches associations, uh, both as a commissioner and as representatives on various NCA and CCA committees, and, and that no one has been better represented uh, by their executive director than, than the baseball coaches have by Dave. And, and uh, he's going to be sorely missed, and, the, and that the state of baseball is vastly improved today, largely because of the fact that he's been able to herd a lot of cats. Uh, to, to get things done for the sport of baseball. And, and uh, I think that as he walks away from, into his exciting new um, uh, you know, phase of his life, he's going to be able to hold his head up high and know that, that he has made a significant um, uh, contribution to the sport that he loves. So, Dave, you're going to be missed. Dave. Uh, thank you, Dennis. That's very kind of you. I appreciate that. Uh, but there's been... Uh, over the years, uh, I think this, I'm, I'm not sure how many years I've been here, but it's been over 30 to watch the game grow as it has and become as significant as it has on college campuses and in conferences and around the country and here in Omaha. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, but I'm certainly not going to take credit for that because it's involved hundreds of people, uh, the NCAA working with them very closely, and mostly our coaches in the job that they've done uh, over this long, long period of time. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a great run, and I uh, agonized, I think, over this uh, 
this decision because I feel I could do this a long time yet and continue to really enjoy it. However, it's time uh, for my wife and I to move on to do some things we've always wanted to do but haven't had the opportunity to do it. And we feel as long as we have our health and energy, now is the time to start. Uh, so it's been, a, it's been a great run. It's been really enjoyable. Uh, in the 30-some years I've been here to see this tournament and what's happened to college baseball over the years has been very, very satisfying. Our game has never been better. More good coaches, more good players, more good facilities, more good programs, more teams that are capable of winning the national championship or getting here. Uh, it's, a, it's a great feeling uh, to maybe you've been a little bit part of that. Um, I'm extremely proud that our board of directors has hired uh, Craig as our new executive director. I think we had uh, 92 people apply for the position. Uh, they had, uh, they must think it's easy, I guess. Um, five, five they interviewed in Dallas, uh, and the board uh, uh, selected Craig. But more so, the, uh, not only because he's my son, I'm proud of that, but the fact that he has the expertise, uh, the work ethic, the people skills, <laughs> and the uh, commitment to uh, continue to do this uh, type of work, and I don't think we'll miss a beat. And in fact, a lot of things will improve greatly because of new technology and uh, things. Our, two, two of our staff members are moving down to North Carolina to join Craig. In fact, they're already down there and bought homes. Uh, and so it, uh, the, the change uh, will, we, you'll see no change uh, except for things continuing to hopefully even get better. So it's been a pleasure to be in this position. I'll continue to be around. I'll serve on the board. I'll be here every year. Uh, but I want to thank all of you uh, as well for what, uh, not only your friendship, but what you have brought our game in terms of exposure and, and uh, your devotion to it. So thank you. Finally, Craig. All right, thank you very much. Well, I'm excited to take on this new position, and uh, it's an honor to follow in, in my father's footsteps, and it's, it's rather odd and, 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 and an honor to follow him. Uh, but the first uh, order that I had to take on was getting new offices, and we knew we had to get a little bit bigger because we wanted to put an extra office in there for, for him to come down. And so he says he's going to travel a lot, but I think it's going to be down in North Carolina and making sure we're doing a good job with this organization. But uh, I'm excited about uh, where college baseball is. I'm excited about where it's going to continue to go because the way it's the way it's built over the years, it's just exciting. I remember um, it was probably close to 30 some years ago when I first came down here, and uh, my mom didn't know about this, but my father and, and Dennis Pope had my or myself and uh, Carl go up on top of Rosenblatt Stadium to do tornado watch. And so that was an interesting time. And boy, I thought I was a real good administrator at 10 years old to do a uh, tornado watch. So I couldn't get, wait to get home to tell my friends about uh, my first duty at the College Baseball World Series. Uh, when my mom found out about that, she wasn't as happy with my father about that. But uh, it's, uh, it's been a great ride. I'm looking forward to it. I have a lot to learn, but I have a great mentor to learn from and exciting time and, and getting ready to meet the board of directors and uh, working with them over the next couple days. Open it to questions from the field. As a reminder, please introduce yourself and your affiliation. Aaron Fitt, Baseball America. Um, curious about you know, late other legislation that maybe is on the way. I know things are kind of in, in pause right now, but I know there was a proposal by the American Athletic Conference uh, maybe to, to expand the field to 64. Um, is that something that you guys are, are interested in or curious kind of for your, your reception to that idea and, and any others that have kind of come up this year? Dennis, can you begin? Okay. Uh, well, first off, it's, it's something that we haven't discussed at any length as, as the um, baseball committee. I think that we're always interested in providing more opportunities for student athletes, but at the same time, we also don't want to do anything that's going to necessarily um, uh, negatively impact the integrity of the of the tournament and right now I think we're in a good place from a structural standpoint with the tournament with the the regional and super regional uh, uh, concept that, that we have so I think that um, this will obviously be a uh, decision that I won't be a part of uh, since I'll be coming off the committee after this World Series 
but uh, from my standpoint, I would be a little bit um, uh, more um, conservative about moving forward with something that, that could negatively impact what we think is a good thing right now. I, I just don't think that the tournament is broken. Damani? I think, I think as staff, one of the things that we'll want to do is frame the issue for the committee to help them make a decision. So, so we do that by looking at the recommendation, talking about the pros and cons, what are the implications of that um, if it were to happen, frame it not just as a, a baseball issue but how it, how it impacts our other championships, how it impacts the association. There's a lot of things going on right now with the association, so is this the right time to do it? Um, this is, for example, one of the ways in which we engage with the ABCA, get feedback from them, ask them to survey coaches when, when these kinds of format issues come up. And I think, they're, you know, I think they're healthy sort of discussions and debates to get into every few years. You probably don't want to have the discussion every year, but every few years I think it's, it's really good and healthy for the sport to have a discussion about are we in the right place from a format standpoint. Dave or Craig. Well, certainly one of the greatest things that happened in Division I baseball and two and three as well was the bracket expansion. When we went from 48 to 64 teams, that was huge because it not only gave an opportunity for more good teams to get in, it gave a tremendous amount of hope to a lot of programs saying, well, I probably couldn't get in with 48, but with 64, our programs got a chance to get in. But when we expanded that, it worked in a way that it, it was set up in such that it was at least fair to everybody that was involved in the tournament uh, with the, with the four-team tournaments. Originally, when we started out, you had some 16 tournaments and some four-team tournaments, but at least everybody's pretty much on an equal basis. If you expand to, say, 72, and then you have a play-in, now that affects it a little bit differently. So that's one thing that has to be studied by the committee. Uh, also, we'll discuss this with our coaches uh, and see where to go. And, and Aaron, you wrote a very good article about that, and I think you touched upon all the, all the uh, points very well. Craig, do you have anything to add? I, I don't know if I have much to add other than when you can involve more student athletes and, and it's a positive experience for more student athletes. It's something you definitely want to take a look at, but it has to fit within the parameters of what you're doing with all your sports uh, among, among the NCAA. So. I'd like to see it play out and see where it takes us. Our next question comes from the back on the right. Uh, Howard Borden, Omaha, uh, KCRO Radio. A question for everybody, a, a couple parts to it. Uh, maybe, Dennis, you could enlighten us first. Uh, the process of picking the 64, uh, very interesting. This year, uh, the, on the super uh, seeds, the top eight, two get here out of the eight. Um, and then, of course, there are bubble teams now. It's kind of interesting talking about baseball, the teams that were knocking on the door that almost got here. W were you pleased uh, overall looking at how everything was gridded, how the tournament played out, and, and where we are now on it? And then uh, the next question would be, would there ever be a situation where we would go to the regional level where we'd have 32 regions, two out of three that set up more uh, geographically uh, to get then to the Sweet 16 to the Elite Eight? And that question will be for everybody. Well, I, <coughs> excuse me. Um, first off, I, I made the comments following the, uh, uh, the, the announcement of the brackets that um, this year, my fourth being on the committee, was one of the more challenging years in terms of the parity that, that's out there in baseball. And I think that the committee can only do its best uh, efforts in identifying the, the 33 uh, uh, at-large teams and then seeding it as best it can on the, the information that we have available. This year's committee is a very experienced committee, uh, very dedicated committee. Uh, there's no wallflowers in that room. Everybody uh, had opinions. Uh, it was a good, healthy conversation that we had. And, and in retrospect, I think that uh, what's happened with the, the tournament to this point has just reconfirmed uh, the difficulty that we had with the, the parity in the, the game. That uh, you give a team a chance, like a UC Irvine, who we acknowledged as being one of the, the four last teams in, that once you give them a chance, anything can happen in this sport. 
and I think that that's healthy. I think it's good for the, the growth of the sport. Uh, over the, the four year, 10 year that I've been on the committee, we've had teams like Kent State and Stony Brook and Indiana make it to the, to the uh, College World Series, which I think is very healthy for the sport as we all want the sport to be a national sport and not just a Sunbelt sport. And so I think that um, the fact that, that we had so many upsets uh, just reiterated the parity that we had in, in the sport this year. Um, in terms of um, uh, the structure of the tournament, I, I guess I'll lead off that we've had those conversations in the past. Uh, again, I think that it'll be something that'll continue to be um, explored by the, the committee in the future. Uh, is there a better mousetrap out there, basically? And I think that we all need to be, you know, open-minded enough to, to look at that. But uh, certainly from my perspective right now, I think that the, the, the tournament, uh, you know, has been interesting. It's been well-received by the, the public, by the media, and that, uh, you know, we're in a good place right now as, as a uh, championship. Craig, can I ask you to ch chime in on this 32 region <laughs> possibility? Well, when that came up a few years ago, I thought it was a very interesting concept. And uh, uh, I, I believe, if, if I'm correct on this, the coaches were not in favor of that. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, yeah. We uh, discussed this, uh, <laughs> sent out a survey on that. And at that time, the coaches uh, did not want to uh, change the present structure. However, it does lead some interesting things. If you were to have, as Howard suggests, uh, and it had been discussed by the baseball committee, uh, that uh, if you had 32 two-team regionals, is just 16 more exposures in that area of the country. Uh, and it's a big deal. It's a big deal when you have an opportunity to, to host a region. Uh, my last year's head coach at Central Michigan, 1984, we had an opportunity to host the regional. At that time, there were only eight in the country. And people in Mount Pleasant and CMU people still talk about that. It was, uh, it's a huge thing. So that's the one nice thing about that format, the extra exposures. But there's also some other things. And like I say, when we did survey our coaches at that time, the majority liked the way the setup was. But that can always change. I, I'll tell you, I personally like that setup uh, to look at. Coaches, uh, just like it seems like everyone's a little reluctant to change, but you'd have to go through it, study it to see how it would play out. But when you have an opportunity to host a regional, like you were saying, I think that's a tremendous opportunity for your fans to think different about your program, your school, and, and what it brings and, and, and the strengths that it brings to your program. So I'd, I'd love to see that continue to be explored. We'll take our next question from the front. Kendall Rogers, perfect game. Uh, Dave? Uh, this is for Dave and Craig, but Dave, what's one thing that you were un unable to uh, get done that you kind of would like to see get done in the future, kind of the one thing for you and for Craig? Uh, what's kind of your, your first thing that uh, you really want to kind of tackle in terms of issues in college baseball? Well, and one of the things that I had always hoped for is that we could get additional scholarships. Uh, we, um, uh, we're at 11.7, as you know. However, we've got 297 Division I schools, and not all of them are 11.7. .7. A lot of them are, in fact, a large percentage aren't even at that number. But I always felt if we could get to 14 or 15, it would give us an opportunity to get some elite athletes that are now playing football. Uh, we have a lot of, of athletes out there that are exceptional athletes that play football and baseball, but they lean towards football where you can get a full ride. In, best, in baseball, you might get 50, 60 percent if you're really a top-notch player. And if we got to the level where we could, uh, had, could give two or three full rides in a program, right now it's very difficult to do with only 11.7 when you're trying to put a team of 35 together or 27 scholarship players. Um, that is, that's almost impossible. So I always thought if we could increase by a couple, uh, or two and a half, uh, that would allow us to do, do that, it would make our game even better. However, at the same time, keep in mind, it would even uh, make the gap wider between the haves and the have-nots, which is pretty significant right now, uh, but uh, make it even greater for those that couldn't, couldn't catch up to that number. But uh, one thing that I always hope for is more scholarships. 
We had a, I had a special conference of Division I head coaches in Indianapolis a few years ago to discuss uh, all of the issues that we wanted to approach. And Damani was there, Denny Pope, uh, uh, Miles Brand, President Brand. Uh, it was a great two-day conference of what we want to try and be and what we want to uh, uh, pursue. And basically, most of those have been accomplished except for the scholarship thing. Well, a little bit more on that. I, I would love to see that increase. Uh, you know, being an athletic director for quite a few years now, and you meet with families, and you, you, you really figure out the reality of it. So at 11.7 scholarships, and you make a pretty good offer at 50%. Take a school, for example, High Point University, which, which I'm leaving, but uh, uh, you talk to a parent that's 45,000 hours to go there a year. And so you get a 50% ride, and you see the parent's face when you talk to them about okay, we're gonna take care of half of it. That just means you have to come up with 22,000 some odd dollars per year and you can see their brain start to work after four years, that's gonna be fairly expensive. And so you see money come into play on a lot of decisions based on the coach you'd like to play for, the school you'd like to attend and who you'd like to be coached and mentored for for four years sometimes changes and it's more important about money. And that's, I, I wish that, there, or I hope that that's something that we could change to get more money into it. But it's a, it's a very complex issue that deals with Title IX and the way it bumps up against other sports. So uh, it's a little bit easier said than, than just people putting more money into it. Our next question comes from the right in the middle. Yeah, Lou Pavlovich, Collegiate Baseball. This is for Damani and anybody else who wants to uh, chime in. Uh, a huge discussion right now is the Pac-12 conference. They want more autonomy with their decisions, and I'm sure the other big power conferences. Uh, for Damani, I was wondering, is this something that could hugely impact college baseball down the road? I, th I think there's a lot of sort of question marks that exist regarding what are the implications, particularly as you start looking at individual sports. The conversation right now, which Dennis is very much involved in, is, is very much at a macro level, which is looking at the overall structure of the association. How are we governing ourselves? How are we making decisions? I think a lot of people can speculate about individual things and how it might impact a particular sport. Um, I think the short answer is probably it's a little too early to tell how it might impact baseball. I think we all have thoughts, but probably a little early to tell. Dennis, yeah. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with what Damani said. I think that right now, and I'll be leaving for a couple of days this next week to go attend the, uh, the Collegiate Commissioner Association meetings at, at which this is obviously going to be a major um, agenda topic. And, and the, the discussion is more about structure of the NCAA and, and the, the, how governance is going to work in the future, not so much about what the end game is going to be. Now, the end game is always in the back of people's minds as you enter into those types of conversations, but I think that we don't know how it's going to affect a sport like baseball at this point, so. Dave or Craig, I thought you got cut off. There's nothing more that I can add to that. It's just all speculation and really unknown at this point. Our next question on the left in the middle. Uh, Jim, Jim Meyer, uh, championship thinking coach, uh, Omaha guy here. Uh, and by the way, welcome all back. You know, so I, and and also Damani. I remember last year you're setting up with Dave. I remember with Dennis, and mm -hmm. right. And now you kind of like got it. And next year I'm looking ahead. See, to Dave and Craig, you'll be here. Um, the transitions are happening, which Somebody is else will be here other than me. Also, <laughs> and then, <laughs> which which is my prelude to the question is is the recruiting uh, realities with technology today, and there's been some significant, uh, speaking of autonomy, mm -hmm. shifts, I guess. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, how's that gone, you know? And, I, and, and just as, as an example, I was talking to one of the, uh, I call it the elite programs, uh, pers people who was talking about, uh, and he wasn't being uh, negative, uh, but he said, you know, but recruiting anymore for me, it's not just a technology, because it's a two-part question here, is, is you know, we, we really have to be looking at freshmen and sophomores in high school now because of that discussion, so. Uh, so I guess my question is, the technology part, how is that affected from an NCAA's perspective? 
from a, from a national perspective, just the issue of technology and recruiting is, is not a new issue. It's probably one we've been talking about for the better part of the last 10 years. You know, it really, it started with email um, and then the growth of the internet and then text messaging and that becoming more accessible for prospects at lower price points. Then our, our rules began to adapt and adjust. And as new technology comes online, we, we have to evolve our rules to to stay up to speed with it. So it's it's one thing that I think we'll just continue to, to work on, continue to discuss um, as, as far as our coaches are concerned. Obviously, they want to be able to recruit and want to be able to do it in an efficient manner. I think that's what drives it a lot, is how can we recruit efficiently? Um, and so to the extent that we can do that while still maintaining some of the philosophical parameters we have with recruiting, I think is, is where we always try to head. Next question on the right in the middle. Yeah, uh, this is for Dennis. Brian Davis, the Austin American Statesman. Um, the three teams from the Big 12 that are here were the three worst teams in the league last year based on the standings. Um, very topsy-turvy year for the Big 12. What is your, what was your recollections uh, in leading up to the announcement of the field? What did the room think about the Big 12? What were some of the discussions about some of the teams? Well, certainly the Big 12 was – one of the, the top three conferences that uh, we were looking at at that point, and I guess you could even say top four conferences. Um, Oklahoma State had somewhat distinguished itself, uh, yet uh, its RPI was, was not as high as some of the other teams, so we were wrestling with that. Uh, and, and, and it was really more of a macro issue than, than a micro issue with dealing with the Big 12 because it was an issue that we – had in a number of conferences where the computer power rankings of teams didn't necessarily match up with the, the conference standings that, that we had. So, uh, you know, I've been very comfortable the last few years on the committee. I, I, coming onto the committee, I was always a, a critic of the use of the RPI for uh, the selection and seating process of um, uh, the, the tournament, but I think over the last three, four years, we have really delved into how teams build their RPIs, and, and sometimes that exposes teams. Other times it shows that teams that maybe don't have the RPIs that, that um, you know, uh, they, they deserve, uh, they're not the victims of anything that they did, but it could be that they scheduled strong teams uh, but those strong teams that they scheduled didn't necessarily have the years that they thought they were going to have. So we had to look beyond, you know, just the raw numbers. I've used this comment many, many times that, that uh, if you do it right, I think that the, the, the whole process of putting the, the, the field together, selecting the at-large teams, seeding the, the, the national seeds, the number ones, is really a marriage of, of art and science. And the science is the RPI. The art is all the other I tests. You know, and we use the, the input from regional advisory committees. Uh, and I think that that's been very um, uh, helpful during my tenure on the committee to hear what the regional advisory committees think of the teams in their own regions as well. So. Uh, recognizing that some regions may be bigger than others and have more coaches on their advisory committees and who the individuals might be. So you, you even have to take that to, you know, into account. But uh, in terms of specifically the Big 12, it, it was a challenge because the RPIs were not matching up necessarily with, with the uh, standings that, that we were looking at. Question in the middle. Right here in front. Pete LaFleur, College Baseball 360. Question for uh, Dennis and Damani. Uh, it's interesting you bring up Oklahoma State. Um, in, in softball, they seed the top 16 um, and match up one, the winner of the one plays 16. So in this case, Oregon hosted uh, Minnesota, who was the clear, you know, realis realistically, the 16. Um, but by extension, Oregon State was was paired up with Oklahoma State, which you're indicating was maybe if there if you had seeded the tournament out further, maybe it was nine or ten. Um, you could have a scenario where a, a team is the clear cut number one has an amazing season, 54 and six or something, 
and yet they get a kind of a, t a tough draw in that super regional um, based on um, geography. I know like the Florida schools get matched up, Texas schools a lot. Uh, so do you foresee ever seeding the 16 like softball does, or do you foresee avoiding the, the geographical expense saving criteria so that the Florida schools aren't always playing, you know, people talk about Clemson and South Carolina always being matched up, things like that. Where does the committee on that? I don't know if the well, ABCA guys have anything. I'll answer and then Damani you can add. Um, first off, that's an excellent question and, and one that we had a very robust uh, uh, discussion about among the committee two summers ago, I believe it was. Uh, and actually I was one of the proponents to, to look at seating the top 16. But as the committee delved into it a little bit further, we came to the realization that in baseball, you have so many conferences that are represented by multiple teams within the top 16, that if you're going to do a, a true one through 16 national seed, that you're probably going to wind up with, you know, a number one SEC team playing a number 16 SEC team, or a number two Pac-12 playing a number 15 Pac-12, and that at uh, once you start making adjustments to avoid those types of matchups, then it you basically thrown out the whole concept of seeding one through 16. So based on that robust uh, uh, debate that we had, the committee elected at that point to stay with just the, the, the top eight <coughs> seeds. Now, is that something that they should continue to look at? Yeah, I think they should. Um, because I think that we see it out west also, and that you could have a, a number one uh, seed being matched up with a team that might be the ninth best team. So uh, I think it's something that the committee should continue to look at, but I think there are legitimate reasons why we do it the way we do it right now as well. Right, it, it, it happens in a number of other, other sports. Volleyball it, uh, is the same way as well, so there's, there's, there's a number of uh, sports, but, but this committee, which has the prerogative to, to, to uh, act on the, the best interests of their sport as they see it, has elected to, to not go in that direction at that point and to, primarily to avoid those conference matchups and super regionals as much as possible. Yep. I think to be clear, we do have the ability to seed one through 16. We just choose not to for the reasons that, that Dennis mentioned, that you know the committee over the years has, has agreed and continue to agree that this is probably the most pragmatic format for baseball. Um, you know, I think a lot of our geographic constraints sometimes get viewed through this prism of, of resources and money and as cost savings, and while that's true, there's other issues at play. Um, you know, when you look at some of our regionals particularly, but even some of our super regionals and the crowds that we have at those stadiums, a lot of that's driven by geography. For those visiting team fans to be able to get to those stadiums is really great for baseball. To, to see those games on television with full stadiums is, is really good for college baseball. And then you also have the issue of travel. I mean, you talk to some of these teams throughout the tournament, um, they're doing a lot of travel. So to the extent that we can keep them within a time zone or a region, is just gonna make life better for them. So seeding one through 16 is probably the most perfect from a mathematical standpoint, but there's a lot of downsides as well. We have time for two more questions. We'll take the first one along the right in the middle. Yep, uh, Kirk Bowles from the Austin American Statesman. For anybody to care to answer it, uh, for baseball to continue to grow and get to the next level, I would assume scholarships would be the number one thing, but maybe the most unlikely. But there are one or two others, maybe an improvement on the baseball or making this park smaller, recruiting more Paul Bunyans. Or, uh, what do you feel like the best thing baseball can do to advance the game? I mean, uh, I lose them? Okay. Um, I think scoring is certainly one that, that um, uh, every, is on everyone's mind. Um, I don't think we're far off on where we are with that right now. I think that, uh, um, you know, I've had the privilege over the last 10, 15 years of serving on three different uh, committees now involved with baseball. First, the Baseball Issues Committee, then the Baseball Academic uh, Working Group of the NCA, and then the most recent one, obviously, the championships. 
And I think that, that there's been a number of decisions that have been made uh, by the NCAA based on recommendations coming out of all three of those um, um, uh, committees that have helped create the parity that we're seeing in baseball today. And I think that the parity is, is really healthy. Um, I think that the fact that you have some squad limits uh, allows talent to be spread around a little bit more, uh, that you have a specific start date now uh, has uh, cut down on some of the Sunbelt uh, program's ability to uh, start their games in January and spread their s seasons out over a three or four more week uh, period of time. Um, and then uh, obviously the bat uh, issue. So I think that all those things added up together along with the scholarship, uh, not the scholarship, but the squad limit uh, that came out of the, the baseball academic working group has driven us to where we are today. And I think that the parity is great for the game. Um, could it use a little more scoring? Yeah, a little bit more, but I don't think going back to where we were in the late 1990s is certainly the answer, so. It'll be interesting next year. Of course, we go to the, the new ball, the flat seam ball, which uh, based on the research, if that is true, and I have no reason to think that it isn't, it, it's gonna lead in more home runs. Uh, when uh, the research shows with the flat seam ball as opposed to the raised seam ball, which we're using now, uh, it's going to increase a ball that's hit a significant difference by that. I mean, 350 feet or more, it's going to add 20 feet to that. Those balls that are now in the warning track are going to be home runs in the future. Uh, so that's going to lead right there to more home runs, uh, more runs scored. One other thing that, is, that has really helped our game and will continue to help, I think, is the new Major League Baseball Players Association Collective Bargaining Agreement. Uh, you're, this is the second year of that. And there's a couple things there. Um, the earlier signing date, this year I believe it's um, uh, um, the 12th of July, I believe. Uh, uh, July 12th, they moved that up a, a year or a, a month, which, which certainly helps uh, with our, our coaches and knowing where, there's, where they stand. But a couple of the biggest things was is there's 40 rounds now instead of 50. But the biggest thing, the most significant thing is, is that while baseball doesn't have a salary cap, they do have now a pool of money that you can work with with your t first 10 picks. Anybody that's drafted in the 11th round on, that cannot receive more than $100,000 without that money in excess of $100,000 uh, counting against that initial pool to sign your first 10 picks. And I think coaches, or coaches have said this is really significant because they are now keeping players or getting players that were drafted in the 12th round, the 18th round, the 22nd round, that they were losing in the past. They, they might draft somebody in the 15th round, they follow them all summer, the kid has a great summer, and all of a sudden they're offering $300,000 and he signs. So that has helped significantly, and I really feel uh, in, in our meetings with, with Major League Baseball and the Players Association, the majority of the general managers, scouting directors, feel that college is the best way to go for many kids. Now, they're still going to take their three, four, or five tool players out of high school, but I think many of them are thinking uh, along the lines of um, let them go to college, see how they develop. We're not throwing money out the window on a lot of these kids. They're more developed mentally and physically, and we'll go in that direction. Uh, a, one of the guys that have been, one of the individuals has been really instrumental, I think, in, in helping us in college baseball that we've met with is Dave Dombrowski, the general manager and president of the Tigers. And if you looked at the last three tra drafts of the Tigers, three years ago, um, uh, 19 of the first 21 picks were college players. Last year, their first 22 picks were college players. And this past June, their first pick was a high school kid, a great kid by the name of Hill, I believe, out of California, that is a 5-2 a player. So they took him number one. Their next 29 picks were college players. And there's more and more, I think, organizations going in that direction, and that's really going to help college baseball. 
Take our final question from Kendall up at the front. Yeah, this is uh, kind of going off the scholarship talk earlier, but uh, one of the things kind of intriguing is the fact that, you know, Dave's always talked about how a majority of the schools can't, can't afford to have more scholarships at, at this point. Uh, it's going to increase the have and have nots. Has there ever been a discussion about maybe breaking up uh, into, into two divisions of the schools that can, that can afford to increase scholarships and the schools that simply just don't have the money to do that? And this is for uh, Damani and Craig. I'm, I'm not aware of any discussions about essentially subdividing baseball. You know, we, we have that in football with FBS and FCS. I've not heard any discussions about that. I, I think all the conversations we've had about the sport of baseball and growing it has been about growing the 297 uh, teams, not, not growing half of them or some of them. Um, you know, the, some of the more far-reaching conversations we've had with Major League Baseball, that's been actually one of the more pointed issues is we want to do something that's good for all of baseball, not just for the top 50, 7,500. I would agree with that. I don't think there's any more to add to that. Um, along the other lines with the ball, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next year. And I think it's uh, – we all have a uh, – we like to see steps ahead of each other the one step that's going to take uh, place next year with the new ball, let's see that play out before we start making other changes. And then just one last one, Aaron, I had cut you off, so we're going to let Aaron take one last question. Um, Go ahead and speak up. Okay. Um, kind of an old topic, but uh, got brought up again this year, I think, by uh, some coaches. The idea of, of – um, potentially moving the season back dramatically. I know it's a radical change, but um, of trying to play in the summer, basically. I'm curious, um, do you guys think that something you would ever consider, or that something you might be receptive to as far as trying to play baseball during baseball weather instead of you know dealing with snowstorms for the first month of the season? Well, I'm going to be very blunt. Well, uh, uh, I would not support that. And, and I don't think that there would be much support nationally on that. Um, I think just moving a, a college sport outside the academic year is something that, that uh, people would have a real tough time grappling with from a um, philosophical standpoint. Uh, that uh, you, know, you have to allow some time off for student athletes uh, to pursue whatever they want to pursue. Um, uh, during the summer months, it may be playing in summer league baseball or, or going home and working in a grocery store, who knows, but, um, or pursuing their academics. Um, so I, I don't think that it's going to uh, be something that I would support as a conference commissioner. And, and uh, I've had lengthy conversations with other commissioners about it. And I don't think that there's as much of a, um, uh, you know, wave of discussion, at least at my level, as there was five to ten years ago about that. So it, I think, again, because of the parity that we're seeing in the sport where, it, you know, schools from the northern areas like a Stony Brook, a Kent State, and Indiana can still succeed and make it to Omaha, that uh, it's as much of an issue as maybe it was considered 10 years or so ago. So that's I, my I, opinion. I agree. I think there's less urgency based on, on competitive reasons for doing that. And, and if there is a change, I think we're, we're looking really far out. I think at that point, now you're talking about the structure of higher education changing. Because I, I agree with Dennis. I think the season being attached to the academic year is important. So unless higher education evolves to more of a, a year-round or balanced calendar, I don't see baseball separating itself. I'll just mention I probably spent eight years um, when I was on the baseball committee, then chair of the baseball committee, and then in this position of trying to get it moved back two weeks. And I think that, I mean, this uh, seriously, this went on for eight years. And uh, uh, with the championships cabinet, we finally got it moved two weeks, but then one, at the same time, we went to expand to 64. So one of those was taken up by the super regionals. So at that rate, I'll be 147 <laughs> before, before we, get, uh, we get any farther beyond that. All right, Leif, to thank everyone for coming out and thank the four people here in front of us, Dennis, Damani, Craig, and Dave. Thank you very much.
to see a, a Big West team here probably in a few weeks. I know Jerry Chess coming in for a game. So. Yeah, she is. Still uh, over at Craig? Yes, sir. What's, you enjoying that? Or? It was fun. This year was a good time. Obviously, it was nice to have the McDermott uh, run. Yeah. It's always always a nice thing. How crazy was that? Thank you. Yeah. Is it fun or is that crazy? It was fun. I mean, yeah. it was fun for me. I enjoyed it. Uh, I wasn't the direct person responsible, so it's a little easier. Yeah. Bob had to take yeah, care of all actually, of the yeah. chaos, yeah. and I got to handle and I'll be back some of the side stuff as well as women's basketball. Okay. Yeah. 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 They had a nice so run in the Big East, and certainly a little bit better travel yeah. than yeah. New York as opposed to Arizona. Yeah. Right, right. right. And they were the last yeah. ones standing. Yeah. 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 So, um, Well, you know, in this sport, the best team doesn't always win. So, you know, you have to have a little bit of luck and, and uh, you know, yeah. Well, in Major League Baseball, every team wins 60 and every team loses 60. It's what you do with the other 40. That, that, yeah, it is. And it's going to be fun. You can say So we'll, we'll sit down and talk, okay? With the conference and they don't make the tournament. All right, Jim.
good.
Welcome back for our third press conference today featuring the combatants from our games on Saturday. And first and foremost, we'll introduce from left to right in his eighth season, or excuse me, his 12th season at Vanderbilt, making his second trip to the College World Series, head coach Tim Corbin. Continuing left in his eighth season at Louisville, making his third trip to the College World Series as a head coach, Dan McDonald. Continuing down the line, our next coach is in his seventh season at UC Irvine, making his fifth appearance at the College World Series, including winning the title in 2001 with USC, UC Irvine's Mike Gillespie. And finally, making his 15th appearance as a head coach of the CWS with three national titles with Cal State Fullerton and two with Texas, 
Longhorn Skipper Augie Garrido. We would ask that each of you begin with an opening statement, and I'll ask first Dan McDonnell to begin. We're going youngest, I guess, in order. It's sort of the joke, but okay. <laughs> the, uh, we're, we're honored to be here. Uh, obviously, want to congratulate uh, the other seven schools here. Uh, we, we know how difficult it is to get here and how much parity is in college baseball, but uh, really proud to represent uh, the University of Louisville and uh, our great fan base. And uh, got a great group of kids playing hard, great coaches, and uh, fabulous administration. So this is an honor for us. We're really excited to be here as well. Coach Corbin. Likewise, uh, we're, we're very excited to, to be here. It's our second time. We were here in 2011 with a new group, and this group is new too. We have two kids who were on that team that were redshirted, so they didn't get to experience this. But uh, we're certainly, after going through the SEC season and going through the tournament, uh, thankful and fortunate to, to get through teams like Oregon and, and Stanford. So uh, we were playing well and uh, hopefully continue to do so. Coach Bolesky. <coughs> I feel like we're the party crashers if, if we had to do it. Um, UC Irvine, as I think probably everybody in the room knows, was here without me uh, in 07, I think that was. So uh, only, only a couple of our coaches were on that team. None of our players, of course, uh, were here at that time. Um, we've had an interesting road to get here. Uh, it's been exciting. Um, we, we feel like we are, uh, we feel like we're a team that, uh, like I suppose most coaches feel if, if we, if we pitch it pretty good and if we catch it, well then we've got a chance. Uh, I will tell you this, that, uh, Omaha, the College World Series is a dramatically different place, uh, from when, when the last time I was here, and this uh, this event has, which was great then, I can promise you, has blown up by 500. Um, it's a spectacular opportunity, and uh, I'm really, really glad our players get to experience this. This is this is sensational. Coach Garrido. I think our story starts with uh, the end of last season and when Mark Payton, uh, our senior center fielder, and Nate Thornhill, the senior pitcher, uh, decided to forego their opportunity for another year in professional baseball for the sake of the team. We had a rough year uh, during that period of time. Uh, I was reminded that the team had finished last in the conference since 1956. And so um, they came back. And I did ask the question, I don't know what happened in 56, but what happened to them in 57? And they said they went to Omaha. And Mark and Th Nate uh, paved the way for this to happen. The other great thing about that, I think he, both of them taught the rest of our players, and we do start three freshman position players, what they have to give up to be able to move forward as a baseball team. All of the teams in this tournament have found the oneness that it takes to be able to execute and trust that their teammates will depend on each other to get the job done or they wouldn't be here but Mark and Nate are the ones that set the tone. I heard several of our players talk during their press conferences about how much that impressed them and made it mandatory for everyone on the team to be unselfish. And that's, that's how we got here. I'm also thankful for the fact that those freshmen, Mark and Nate are the only two that were here uh, in 2011 and now uh, we have probably six freshmen on the team that will be able to provide invaluable leadership uh, to, to create their own journey to get back. All right, before we open it for questions, just a few housekeeping issues. Of course, we're, please remember to silence your cell phones. And if you happen to have a wireless device with an RF frequency, that is what is used by the microphone. So if you would turn that off. <clears throat> we'll open the floor to questions. In the back. 
Howard Borden, KCRO Omaha. First of all, coaches, congratulations for uh, getting here to Omaha. I asked this question to the other coaches earlier. Uh, just your thoughts on the style of defense that you play, uh, speed in the outfield, arm strength, and uh, your inner uh, diamond as well, uh, shortstop, uh, second baseman, catcher, and center field as far as your defense and what that means to advance here and get to the two out of three. Coach Gillespie, would you lead us off? Well, I, don't, I really don't think that we're unique with any uh, defensive philosophy. Um, I mean, we, I think, again, like everybody, we're, we're, it, it's certainly a goal to uh, limit extra opportunities for our opponent. I mean, they get three outs. It's not just about outs. It's about extra bases. It's about box and wild pitches. And it's not always just errors. It's, it's uh, extra chances that people get. And um, when we've been successful, why? We've been able to accomplish that. That doesn't always happen. Um, our outfield play, um, I think, is solid. Our center fielder can go get the ball in center field. And, and uh, certainly, and I, and I do think that the two guys that play left field and right field are, are skilled and capable. They're not guys that can really fly, but they run decent. And uh, in this park, um, it's pretty evident that uh, you, do need to be able, you do need to be able to go get it. Um, our junior shortstop, Chris Rabago, has been a, a real good player for us for two years. Uh, and he typically is very, 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 very consistent. Um, and he provides leadership through, around the diamond for us defensively. Um, the second baseman is solid. That's Grant Palmer. We play a couple other guys there depending on substitutions and that kind of thing. And um, our catcher, a fourth-year junior, Jerry McClanahan, um, is certainly the guy that kind of runs that pitching staff. And, um, I mean, he's done, a, he's done very well for us. He's been one of the key players for us. So we feel reasonably good about our defense, and it, it certainly we all realize how critical it is, so it better be good. Coach Garrido. I could say almost the same thing that, that Mike just said. Uh, we, we, we made a rule, and we hope they follow it. Get your outs on time. Doesn't matter how, get your outs on time. But I, I think Mike described what our team is like as well defensively. Coach Corbin? We're, we're pretty new defensively, actually. We uh, have a new outfield. A new second baseman, new first baseman, and uh, the catching is uh, has fallen in the hands of two freshman kids right now. I would say we progressively have fielded the ball better uh, during the course of the season. Um, we play a lot of games on turf, so we should. No mystery in that hop. But we, we've handled the ball relatively well, and we've got some pitchers that get off the mound well, too. I, I like our shortstop play. This kid was only made four errors all year. And the second baseman is very athletic and probably could play shortstop for us, but uh, he, he's kind of grown into that second base position. So I, I'm pleased with how we play defense. Coach McDonald. Uh, we got uh, two senior catchers in Gibson and Crane that got to play in Omaha last year, along with a, a talented freshman uh, in Will Smith. Uh, our middle infield, Sutton Whiting and Zach Lucas, uh, two juniors that you know I think are very talented. Uh, the impressive thing about Sutton Whiting, he went through a slump, uh, you know, about a month ago where I didn't realize it was like an 0 for 30 slump, but you would have never known that. Played great defense, and that's tough to do for amateurs, uh, not take their bat to the field and not expose uh, their, their, their struggles. Uh, Alex Chittenden, senior third baseman, just played great. I got two first basemen in uh, Danny Rosenbaum and Grant Kay. And in the outfield, uh, Jeff Gardner is a left fielder. But the other five guys who run around in the outfield are center fielders. You know, uh, Cole Sturgeon, Corey Ray, uh, Colin Lyman, uh, Mike White, and Logan Taylor. So uh, the emphasis of defense has, has been uh, increased in our program uh, with the change of the bats. And um, I'm not a big fielding percentage guy, but um, you know, to me, it's when you make errors as opposed to when you make plays uh, is what really matters. 
Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll continue to play good defense. I'm in the front, Aaron. Aaron Fitt, Baseball America. Um, I'm curious if, if you guys in both matchups feel like you play kind of a similar style of, of play as your opponent here. Obviously, you guys are familiar with each other from last year, and um, you guys have a long history together, I think, as coaches. Do you feel like there, there are similarities with your styles? And if so, um, how does that impact these matchups? <laughs> um, Mike is a lot more daring than I am. He'll, he'll, he'll push the envelope where I won't. And I think that's what kind of separates it. And what I mean by that is the squeeze bunts that he uses and the other things that he uses to manufacture runs goes beyond the types of things that, that I do. Outside of that, it's about the same thing. One of my uh, not so fond memories was in 1995, uh, the college team that I was with lost to Cal State Fullerton uh, when Augie was the head coach there. <coughs> Excuse me. And I distinctly remember that Mark Kotze was on that team. And I also remember that as outstanding a player as he was and outstanding as a hitter as he was, he hit second in the lineup and sacrificed, and he sacrificed in the first inning. And what I came to realize about that was that it was an immediate, valuable contribution. Uh, any player that executes a skill that moves a runner uh, comes to realize and feels actually, I think, a sense of accomplishment um, with that immediate execution of a skill. It really, uh, for me, was a valuable lesson in unselfishness. And uh, it's something that I've always kept in mind because um, if Mark Kotze, who was at the time the best, the best player in college baseball, um, could accept those roles, hey, listen, he got his at-bats, he got his swings, he hit his home runs. Um, but of course, and he was, I think, in my view, Augie, I, uh, of course, he was Augie's player, but I've become familiar with Mark Kotze over time. And so I know he's an exceptional person. And so it doesn't surprise me that he would be that unselfish. But I've often felt that if a guy like that uh, would be accepting of those kinds of team values, well, it was a good lesson for all of us. And so our players, uh, are really made to understand that, that, that this is what, what we have to do. It has to be on anybody to, if a sacrifice is needed, and certainly move a runner, uh, give us a productive out, uh, give, give up yourself uh, uh, for, the, for the sake of the team. I, th I think it was a great lesson for us, and it's something that we've had in mind over all these years. I think when you're you're looking at Louisville and you know we've played them a bunch during the past five or six years, uh, there's some similarities in, in pitching staff, for sure. Uh, always strong body kids who throw the ball well that know how to execute pitches. Uh, from an offensive standpoint, very athletic, uh, can put pressure on you by the way they run the bases, the way they steal the bases, and uh, their kids have a, a good skill set. You know, they're they're hitters from power hitters to gap to speed guys have the ability to do a lot of different things so they can soften the defense. So it, it, uh, it becomes difficult to, to play in a lot of ways. Uh, they they force, force pressure. And as you know, pressure in this game is very valuable when it's applied to the defense and you can't handle it. So um, you, you do have to be able to, to pitch to spots and you have to contain the running game in order to, to keep them down. It seems like a lot of similarities in our lineups. Uh, I think when you look at Vanderbilt and Louisville, you know, I, I think the balance is there. They, they always seem to have a uh, few guys with power, can hit home runs. They always seem to have some uh, high, you know, uh, stolen base threats in the lineup. They always seem to have a few guys that can bunt. Just seems to be one through nine. 
Uh, there's balance. There's there's never really a hole in the lineup, or or they're never one dimensional uh, in one area. They seem to be multi dimensional, uh, and they can do a little bit of everything. Whether that's you know try to try to hit the doubles or the home runs, or maybe even squeeze or steal a base, or or just seem to do a little bit of everything. Jim Meyer, uh, sports psychology coach. Uh, Omaha guy, what, when you have guys, you know, players 19, 18, 20 years old showing up, uh, seeing this ballpark for the first time in this environment, any insights just by you observing them and uh, aha experiences or words they said that kind of even got you excited, I guess, uh, your thoughts about just observing your team show up here so and then they've all been on the field now too practicing so lots well, coach Carrito to begin they start trying to hit home runs just can we hit one out of here and that kind of thing and I don't think there's anything wrong with that I think they're having fun and I think they know what their hitting plan really is and we'll get back to that when the game starts I think the biggest thing that we've established between each other is trust. That goes a long way in teamwork. This whole thing's about teamwork. Coach Corbin? I just, I just think they're kids. Uh, th there's going to be a little bit of a tourist mentality if they've been here for the first time, and uh, I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. Uh, but after some hours, maybe 48 hours, you get to the point where you become Gene Hackman and you get out the measuring tape and you say, this is the foul line and this is the basket and it's the same all the way around. And uh, yeah, I think 18, 19, 20 years old, they just have to be able to contain their emotions a little bit. But they are kids and, and they will do what they do regardless of, of what you say and, and how you train them. Uh, you, you just hope that they're able to execute properly. Coach Gillespie. Well, there's no question about the fact that um, in the case of our players, they are, um, they are dazzled by this ballpark and they're loving it and they're excited by it. Uh, I, I think we'd all be stunned if that was not the case, um, as, as both Augie and Tim have said. Um, and I'm good with that. I really am. I, I mean, I, it would be, <laughs> it'd be difficult to believe if they weren't really drinking it all in, they are. They, they are loving it, and um, naturally, I'm concerned that uh, once we see the burnt orange on, on the other side of the field, and we see the numbers of people in the stands, I am concerned about uh, can they harness their emotions. There's, there's just no question about it. Um, I'm going to trust that. Uh, that they really do know who they are and that once the game starts that they will, they'll be able to settle down and, and deal with it and play, you know, play to the level that they're capable of playing. I was fortunate to work with uh, Mike Bianco for six years at Ole Miss and uh, of course he's from the Skip Burtman family and um, I was able to watch and learn, you know, hosting regionals or super regionals. I, I used to talk to him about the media attention and he had such great wisdom. Uh, so we try to create an atmosphere where we call it controlled chaos. Uh, we got seven little kids on our staff. I shouldn't say little because a couple are in high school, but you know, kids running in and out of the dugout during the season. Uh, we have great uh, media outlets and support in a city like Louisville, Kentucky. And so you, you try to create as much of, of a, a crazy atmosphere as you can, um, but obviously it's just not at this level. And uh, I do like how both coaches use the word uh, trust and the fact that we just keep telling our kids, you know, keep the main thing the main thing. And uh, let's enjoy this and have fun. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it's it's trying to play good baseball and and you know hopefully the experience of coming here last year um, it's still it, you're you're going to be impressed and aha by everything um, as I am but you know hopefully you just uh, you're a little more comfortable with it a little more relaxed and uh, because at the end of the day you just you want to play good baseball in the middle 
Uh, Kirk Bowles from the Austin American Statesman. Uh, Mike, uh, are your pitching plans to start Morales uh, tomorrow? Yes. And go ahead. No, yes, they are. And as far as the finish of uh, your season this year, uh, was the team just so loose and relaxed, you know, going into the regional that played so well? Was it just so focused to prove it was better than maybe being one of the last four to get in? Well, I, I, I certainly don't think it was a matter of being so loose and relaxed. Um, on, on the subject of the way our season ended in our conference, um, what, I've, what I've tried to explain, because this question has come up a lot, and um, the conference that we're in, uh, and, and Augie has a history in this conference, and so I, I think he would be familiar with, these, with all of these people. Um, that conference is an underrated conference, and, and in my experience, um, the conference this year was maybe the best that it's ever been from top to bottom. There were no gimmies in the conference. Uh, we knew going in, however, that the toughest part of the conference was going to be at the back end because we would play Fullerton. Well, we would play Cal Poly, Fullerton, and Long Beach State, all three of whom are really good. And uh, all three are capable of having been here and, and done well here. Um, we lost eight in a row to those three teams, and in five of those eight games, why it was, we had the lead in the eighth and or the ninth. The point of that is, is that there's still losses, but um, they were they were dogfights of games. We competed very very well with with people who were who were going good and were good, and so I kind of feel like had we played those three teams at the very beginning. I'd have a hard time saying the result wouldn't have been the same at the beginning. And if we had the same result with the people we played at the beginning, at the end, well then, shoot, we would have been a strong finisher. Everybody would have said, that's a great club the way they're coming on. Um, our players knew that, um, that they could compete. And um, while, it was, while it was well known that it was uh, anything but a, but a done deal that we would get in, I really felt that that conference warranted five teams being in, and certainly four. So, uh, however, I knew that what might be right and what might be true might be two different things. That it was certainly right that we would get in. I felt that we deserved to be in. I don't think we have to apologize for being in. But on the other hand, there was no denying the truth of the way that last three weeks went. So we could not by any means take for granted that we would get in. Once we got in, um, it wasn't, uh, we didn't feel like we were just playing with house money and that uh, let's just let it all hang out and see how it goes. I think everybody was um, genuinely convinced that uh, we'd be able to compete well. And if we followed the formula that everybody has, which is pitch and catch it and uh, try to scratch together some ways to get a few runs. We might have a chance to. We might have a chance to really succeed, and that's what happened. In the back on the right. Yeah, Pat Borzy with the New York Times. This is for any of the coaches. Uh, Texas Tech against certain batters will, will, for lack of a better term, uh, use some dramatic defensive shifting. They'll put three guys on one side of an infield, etc. I'm wondering how often you guys have seen that from opponents this year and whether with your own, maybe using spray charts or your own scouting, whether you, whether you use it yourselves. Coach Corbin, could you open for us? It, I see way more of that on TV than <coughs> from a major league standpoint than I, I do at the college level, uh, maybe because of the information and maybe really because of the unknown of what our pitcher is going to do. But uh, we, we don't do a lot of dramatic shifting. Uh, we don't overplay too much. We try to balance the field as best we can based on the pitcher and based on what we think the hitter is going to do. Next question. Pete LaFleur, College Baseball 360. Coach uh, Coach Gillespie was wondering if you could share some insight for us on, on Andrew Morales. Had the pleasure of seeing him pitch last week in Stillwater and hearing his comments and then visiting with him the, earlier today on the field. Um, comes across as a very appreciative young man. Um, 
really feels like he grew up and matured a lot, but I just wondering if you could give us some insight into, I mean, he's what, 42 and three in his career in college baseball. That's hard to do with, when you depend on defense and bullpen and offensive support. So what's maybe some of the secrets to his, his, his success that you could share with us? Well, um, the Reader's Digest version, version is that um, while he was a successful pitcher at the high school level and then went to community college because he was, he was not recruited, uh, and not by us either, by the way, uh, he was always thought to be too little and didn't look like they look and really didn't have the stuff of a, of a, of a, of a Division I winning college pitcher. He was a right-handed 5'11", 5'10", high school probably closer to 5'9", kid, 150 pounds. So while he could pitch, um, he was too little. So he went to, as at least he was perceived to be too little, he went to community college in Los Angeles, at Rio Hondo Community College, where he just got gooder. He was better. Uh, he won. And he kept winning. His 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 junior college team had a real successful year, his second year. And he, of all the wins that you talk about, well, 21 of those were in community college. Still, he was not recruited. He was 5'11". He was 87 miles an hour. Uh, threw strikes, won. But the truth of the matter is, he just got missed. And 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 we got we missed too. Uh, actually, one of Augie's former players, Andy Nieto, who coached with me at. Uh, the former school where I was, had played against him in high school and recommended him, really pushed him. And, uh, but it's one of those deals, your scholarship money's gone and there's nothing you can do. And so we floated along, so I had some contact, but there's nothing we can do. But fortunately for us, he was available late and very late. I mean, I'm talking at the very end of his second year. That's how we fortuitously came to have him. Came to us at still 5'11". He's 5'11 today. He'll lie and tell you he's 6'1", but he's 5'11". Um, but the 165 um, has turned into 192 or 95. And so this increased strength has uh, brought with it increased velocity and increased everything, increased bite on his breaking ball. Um, he's always been a, 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 a very, very competitive guy. A uh, very bright guy and um, intensely um, competitive, I think I should say. So he's been a great story. He really is. And I think what, what you described and what, you, what, or what your conclusion was when you met him today is really right on. You know, what, what you saw is what he is. He's a, he's a special kid. And what's so for us, what's uh, among the really gratifying things is that you know, he was always too little. He was he didn't match up. It didn't look like they looked. And so he's always been undrafted. So it was believable that he would be what we call a senior draft this year, one of those money-saving 10th round kind of guys that would get $2,000 and go out and play in Staten Island and maybe get released. And but the fact is he pitched himself above that. And consequently, um, here he is today as a second-round pick. And uh, even though he's a senior, he's going to get himself a nice little paycheck, and that's good to see. Any further questions in the far back? Eric Olson with the AP. Uh, uh, Mike's already announced his pitcher for tomorrow, but could, could the other three coaches uh, announce their starters? We'll begin right next to me, Coach Corbin. Yes, uh, right-handed pitcher Carson Fulmer. He's a sophomore. Coach McDonald. Uh, sophomore, right-handed pitcher, Kyle Funkhauser. Coach Garrido. We'll start uh, Nate Thornhill. He's a senior, and he's right-handed. All right. Thank you very much, coaches. And thank you for joining us once again. ESPN will have media availability at 3 p.m. It'll be Aaron Boone, Carl Ravitch, as well as one of their producers. And if you'd like individual questions for the coaches that are up here, please speak with their sports information director to set that up.
though we lost the next year to Miami in three games. Then I then I got the one to Louisville when Mike lost to Louisville. Charlie's a good guy. Yeah, you got to meet him. Yeah. Super guy. I've done some stuff with him. He talked to our team before we started the region. He's good, man. Very yeah, he's a motivator. Yes. He's good people. You guys will love him. I hope he gets off to a good start.